Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on productization of buildings at Beyond BIM 2021. My name is Marty Rosmanith. I'm the industry sales director for construction cities and territories at the SOS Systems. And today I'm going to walk you through this really um, exciting topic that's quite new. Uh, it's going to build on what we did last year, uh, where we talked a lot about uh, modular and generative approaches, approaches that are typically called um, design for manufacturing and assembly. And so let's go right to that. Uh, last year, we discussed uh, both myself and Jonathan Asher, who's I encourage you to watch his session at Beyond Bend 2021, uh, different approaches to uh, modular and generative design. Uh, and I would encourage you all, because you have access to these videos, to go back and see those. And you'll see them under the 2020 videos section in your uh, Beyond BIM um, members area. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, and I'll discuss a, some more specifics in a minute, uh, is that these approaches are what we would call engineering to order. Um, and we, we would classify design for manufacturing assembly as better than what exists in the field today, but it's still automated bespoke design um, in that it uses automation to improve the efficiency, but it's not an industrial process because it's specific to a project. And so last year I showed an example uh, from M.G. McGrath on the United States Olympic Museum. Uh, using modular uh, design and uh, generative templates in Katia to generate the glass and panel systems for this project. And while it's automated and it is a labor-saving device and it is a great for eliminating rework in the field because of the direct-to-tooling uh, properties of Katia and taking the design straight to uh, the cutters and the, and the benders, um, it is something that was unique to this project, and although M.G. McGrath may reuse these templates on another project at some point, they're going to be applying degenerative approaches in a completely different context. What we're going to be talking about in productization is what I would consider the next level of industrializing the construction process. And I'm going to be talking specifically about customer examples uh, of what's going on in the field today. Uh, the reason these are important is that even with these automated techniques, there are some major chronic problems in construction. Um, although the automation helps in design, the construction process and just the, the way things get built has an inherent unpredictability because of the supply chain and um, the amount of uh, labor on site and the characteristics of different sites and um, how problems that happen on site that aren't caught early enough can compound and delay projects. And so this unpredictability is a, is a risk that has been very, very difficult to address, even with um, advanced uh, 3D modeling systems and, and other systems to try and catch these problems earlier. As a result, the timelines to, de to deliver facilities as the facilities get more complicated are uh, getting beyond the capacity of the process to deliver these facilities. Because of the risk to the schedule and the fact that um, you can very easily trigger a situation where you're going to have a very tough time staying within your schedule, um, there's, a, there's just a lot of unquantifiable risk. And when you sum that up, uh, it affects the ability of the construction process to actually meet the demand uh, for facilities as demand for facilities increases. Um, another such problem is that you have a huge scale range of projects. You have very small projects, you have massive projects. And so if you're going to apply some sort of um, solution to this, it has to be very flexible and adaptable to projects at different scale. Uh, not only does it have to adapt to different scale, but projects have a diversity of sites. So the site conditions vary uh, in some cases immensely from project to project, whether it's slopes or adjacent conditions or even uh, geographic location and the weather uh, and places to uh, have lay down space for temporary um, holding of material on a construction site. So 
The fact that even if we were to standardize a process, we have to apply it to a huge diversity of sites makes uh, for a very challenging um, set of being able to apply automations and, and a process that could make the, the process more predictable. Uh, we also are having demographic factors in that the pool of skilled labor is getting smaller. And so the lack of access to that, especially on the construction site, is starting to be a real impact on the players in construction. Compound all of this with variations by geography, with um, you know where I might source a, a perishable material like concrete from and the trucking time and, um, again, weather and other geographic conditions, as well as variation by construction partners and arrangements and different contract structures. And you just have a very, very complex set of conditions that create a lot of unpredictability and uh, a lot of risk for negative outcomes. And so we've been looking at, you know, what can be learned from what we've seen with DFMA on automating things and in other manufacturing industries to help address these chronic problems. And in short, what if we anticipate these problems and try and create a system that's going to address a lot of them uh, by applying a standardized approach, which has worked in manufacturing? And that is really to reduce the number of things that have to be put together at the point of final assembly. And the point of final assembly for us is the project site. So with that, let's talk about um, sort of some language for manufacturing and um, companies that uh, typically make things in a manufacturing process. So uh, we'll start from the bottom up where we start with engineering to order. We said this bespoke design, even though it's automated, is an engineering to order process. And that means that the specifications that are created for the final product uh, are quite low lev uh, level and there's a lot of um, enrichment that happens over the process of the construction project to get to the point where the actual um, what, the, the, the building or the piece of infrastructure that's the result of the project can be finished. And it's a quite inefficient process as we all know. And so the next level up is what would be called in manufacturing industries, configure to order. And as you can see, there's a big jump in efficiency there because of the level of specification that you can start with. And that leads to a, a, a jump in margin and profitability for companies that are able to move from engineering to order to configure to order. After that, you have all sorts of optimizations that really apply when you're doing things at scale in manufacturing plants. And we're not going to go there, but I did want you to understand engineering to order and configure to order in the context of what we're going to talk about with productization of buildings. And we're going to use an industrial maker of equipment that goes into buildings as our first example, because um, we've actually learned quite a bit from this example and have applied it in um, the rest of the industry. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. So the first case I'm going to show you is Schindler Elevator. And... Um, in their case, they had this same situation. If we start with um, um, the top here, norms and standards, they had an engineering to order process where they were constantly getting drawings for buildings that they would have to spec elevators for. And they were going through a very, very manual process of having to create elevators and escalators for these projects and the huge variety of input conditions, right? The number of floors, the floor to floor height, um, the depth of the structure that they're attaching to, um, you know, the, 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 the support conditions, thermal expansion. There's all sorts of things when you're putting a piece of industrial equipment like that into a building that you have to take in consideration. And with the diversity of sites and the diversity of buildings, it makes for a huge amount of possible <laughs> escalators and elevators you have to create. In fact, if you tried to do something Configured order, you have billions of configurations that are possible um, from, from your standardized parts. So their goal was to move from engineering to order to configure to order and, and try and figure out how to do that. And what they came up with, um, we've labeled generative configure to order. So it's, a, it's different than configure to order where you try and solve for every possible condition and you use something like a product lifecycle management system to then mediate between all the variations. In generative configure to order, you do have all the components for all the solutions, but you don't, uh, uh, I think, generate them in advance. What you do is you have a generative approach that can make any solution as an output, but it takes geometry and other inputs from which it then generates the output. And it's something that's done on demand. Um, so let me show you a little more about what Schindler did here uh, to get to this configure to order um, approach 
that would be then able to serve whatever project they had to put an escalator or elevator into. Um, so first off, they relied on modularity, and modularity in an industrialized um, process has a very specific meaning. So in construction, we talk about modules all the time, and people think of you know, cubes or whatever they might think of as prefab construction, but that's not what a module means when we talk about an industrially produced product, and we're going to use that terminology when we talk about modularizing and productizing construction. So the formal definition of a module is that it is 150% configurable system. And what that means is to get the elevator for your building, you need the 100% configured elevator, meaning that it has to be the elevator that you're going to be receiving to install. The 150% elevator is the complete set of all possible parts for every possible elevator that you might actually make from that generative 150% bomb, as we would call it. And so the 150% configurable system is a very important concept because you have to define this and that will define the universe of things that you can do with that configurable system. The next is that it's delimitized with standardized interfaces, meaning, uh, let's take another example that would apply in construction, a bathroom pod. So what is a bathroom pod? It's a piece of structure, it already has finishes, it has sinks and toilets and showers and plumbing fixtures and lighting. And so all of these things are in the module. And of course, you're gonna standardize where the plumbing connection is, where the electrical connection is, and so those connections are the standardized interfaces that we are talking about. In some cases, they may even be standardized structural interfaces, like the support points for an elevator or escalator. Uh, and then this last part is um, determined by company-specific strategic reasons. So like if you have a specific plant that's meant to produce a certain type of module, you might be choosing your modularization strategy based on on the capabilities of your plant or where you're locating plants we're going to not worry too much about that last one but just remember when we're talking about modules we're talking about 150 percent bomb in a configurable system with standardized interfaces like plumbing and and, um, and electrical connections so what happens when schindler applied this to their um, their business well what they did was they created that 150 percent bomb in our platform and um, in our speak, that would be called the engineering master. That engineering master can produce any 100% configured output for any building uh, that you throw at it, basically. And from that 100% configured output, they would make what they called the BIM twin. And that BIM twin is what would be the deliverables that they would give to the project. So they would receive some BIM data, whether it's IFC or Revit or some other thing from the project team and then run the inputs from that against their engineering master to produce the 100% configured solution for that um, building. Now that 100% configured solution is literally their very detailed uh, uh, mechanical CAD model of all the parts that need to be purchased, machined, and assembled to produce the elevator. From that, they would produce a BIM representation they would be able to give to the design team that would place that as the placeholder for that elevator in their project. And they would generate whatever drawings they needed in order to get the permit, um, order the parts, and in fact, um, do the layout because in elevators, um, many times their crews are the ones doing the installation because ultimately they will be doing maintenance contracts on these things. So all of the necessary deliverables for both the design team and the installation team come from this process. And the main thing which makes it generative is it takes the project geometry as an input in order to get to that BIM twin that's an output that produces all those um, various documents that you see on the right hand side. So um, to put this in more of a process so that you can understand uh, rather than this you know, sort of snapshot of what they did, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how they did it and how the project team interacts with it. So what Schindler did first was they developed, their, they took their custom IP and what they had was they had lots and lots of drawings, AutoCAD files, spreadsheets, PDFs, um, part models and various MCAD systems. They rationalized all that into 150% bomb engineering master on our platform that could then generatively produce any of the elevators or escalators. 
And then from that, um, they took our process engineering tools and basically optimized how those things would be assembled in their various plants that produce these um, pieces of equipment. Uh, and as they worked through that, they would sort of bounce back and forth between the engineering master and the assembly simulation, and they would optimize the design of the master for how it's assembled. And so that's almost like classic DFMA, right? Um, designing for manufacturing and assembly. Um, and they would literally um, simulate the assembly process in order to optimize the design. So that was done by their team, uh, which is what we call the off-cycle product team. And we call it that because it's not part of a project. It's part of Schindler. And Schindler, this is what they do for a living. They make these elevators. And it's going to go into all kinds of projects. But they do it outside the project. This product has its own life cycle. And it's managed as a product. And so when they revise the product and come out with a better version, it's that better version is going to go into every building project that comes up after that. And they need to create they need to have the history of this because they have to go back and service elevators that they made, you know, 10 years ago and five years ago. And so um, for them, managing this product is their business. For the project team, what they do is uh, for them, things don't really change that much. What they do is they start with whatever general arrangement BIM tool they have working at typical levels of development for getting permit drawings like LOD 200. And then they send that information to Schindler, who then uses their engineering master to develop that 100% configured model. And they give the BIM twin to the design team to put that into their project as the placeholder. And even though Schindler has an LOD 400 version of that, they might actually, for protecting their own IP, give the LOD 200 version, say, to the architect to put in their project. And then as they do more of these, they realize that there are further optimizations they can make because after they do 10, 20, 30 projects and they you know, run into a certain design issue on you know, a bunch of them, they might take that from the projects and put it back into their engineering master so they don't have to face that issue over and over again. And this is how the cycle of continuous improvement works for Schindler as they install these things in more projects. So with that, um, if we... Just think about this as a process. What would happen if, as opposed to one supplier, a general contractor did this? Well, this is sort of exactly what we've done with Buig Construction. So Buig has created within their company an off-cycle product team that does 150% bomb engineering masters of things like hospital rooms, um, uh, apartments, uh, you know, th things like, uh, you know, other things like bathroom pods, anything that would be repeatable in a project, you can develop as a custom module uh, and then optimize that for pre-assembly, say in a prefab shop or in an assembly plant somewhere um, where that's done very efficiently because it's been optimized to be repeated over and over and over again. And then the next hospital project you get or the next school project you get or the next apartment building project you get, you're going to use those modules that are now highly optimized to save you a whole lot of time and improve your margins on the project. So again, the project team, not things don't change that much for them. Uh, a little bit more in this process because we're taking whole chunks of building and productizing them. So again, they're still going to start with their favorite BIM general arrangement tool doing permit drawing level detail. But then when they get to the more detailed design that they're going to get into in construction, they go into a process that we've labeled co-creation. And this is where the project team works together with the off-cycle product team to take those modules for hospital rooms or other things and use those for actually doing the detailed design of the project. And so there's this relationship between the general arrangement, which are the geometric inputs, to this 150% bomb that generates the very detailed output that produces the building so that it can reuse all of these components that they've made. And I'm gonna show you what this looks like in just a minute. But again, just like Schindler, as they do more and more of these things, they're gonna find things in the field that they can re reuse back into the engineering master to improve the whole process over time. Uh, so in a nutshell, literally, this is what we've done with we Construction, and um, it's just the beginning, so we've, you know, we've applied this um, on certain projects and there's an increasing number of projects. We've issued a press release on the partnership between um, Buig and Dassault Systems on this, uh, where we're focusing clearly on the building domain, 
Um, this is running on our cloud platform, and the whole point is that it's an integrated team between Buig and Dassault Systems that's close to their field team so that we can make sure this stuff actually works in the field for them because they're trying to transform their company um, you know, from, from having lots and lots of documents to being a data-driven company that, that, that relies on these engineering masters to produce whole chunks of buildings so they have much less to assemble in the field. And that's the goal of productization. It's to make it so you have a much fewer components shipped to the site that get to be assembled. They might be larger, they might be heavier, uh, but you're going to deal with that with cranes and other mechanisms that you're going to have scheduled ahead of time in order to be able to do those installations. So let's uh, look a little bit at how Buig did this. And um, I'm going to show you uh, a video that starts with how they configure a hospital room. Now, this is using one of our um, conceptual design tools. As I said, you could start with your favorite BIM system. They decided to do it this way, and we provided this interface to allow them to choose um, things in the configuration of uh, our hospital room. And then we would take the results of that conceptual general arrangement and put it into our generative um, platform using leveraging CATIA, uh, which would then generate the um, 150 uh, well, the 100 percent configured product from the 150 percent engineering master. And knowing the interface, for instance, between things hanging off the wall like a sink, we can then put the backing boards in, and it's that's all generated automatically because the interfaces uh, tell us where to put them and then we have automations that put them there. And as I show you now, we then instantiate a whole number of these 100% configured models to produce um, a good 80% chunk of the finished building. And as you see, that chunk has all of the detail necessary to do all of the fire piping and the cold and hot water piping and all of the um, duct work and um, electrical routing and all of the things behind the wall in, uh, in a hospital. And this is the point, is that um, all of this stuff is figured out ahead of time so it can be generated as the project demands it, but it's all um, been optimized so that on the project, the project's not paying the price of having to do it from scratch, rather than just reusing the modules that have been done already. And this virtual twin then drives the field execution. So I showed you the example of putting in the backers um, for the plumbing fixtures on, and the cabinets on the other side of the wall. Um, so in this case, uh, we then produce the, the data needed to do the assembly in the, the plants that are making these units and produce the instructions for how they're installed in the field. One thing to note is that the field, uh, just to tell you how they do this, relies on a uh, application, a web-based application we have called 3D Lean. Um, uh, their use of it's confidential, so I've just taken a screenshot of our own in internal use of it at the so Systems because we use it actually to manage ourselves. It's you know essentially a Post-it note based UI, uh, three week look ahead uh, type approach, um, so that they get organized on the on the project site and they've got all of the logistics for what's going to be showing up over the next week, next two weeks um, sorted out ahead of time, so where they're going to put these modules, uh, how they're going to schedule the cranes, that sort of thing. So they're doing this data-driven, but they're using the UI from a very familiar process of post-it notes and putting things on boards and, and stuff like that. It's just they're doing it on large screen monitors now. Uh, but that way it gets to be leveraged so that we can um, always uh, get the most up-to-date information based on the latest plan. All right, so hopefully that covers one level of understanding of what we construction is doing. I think one other thing that I would show you is um, just this generative approach and the fact that you can start with sort of any kind of general arrangement. So in this case, we have a consultant who's taken um, the Revit model for a different type of project, um, and they've pulled in the uh, the, the floors and, and walls for one level of the building. And what they're doing is they're taking a set of these for panelization. So this is a project in Europe. Uh, it's going to use this panelized wall system. Uh, it's a brand name system that's used actually even in our offices at the uh, systems. And, um, and they're gonna take some of these walls and actually panelize them using this system, using this same generative approach. So 
the generator doesn't care where these walls were or where they came from, we're going to apply this 150% bomb and it's going to produce the panel layouts from actually the, the data that came from, in this case, a Revit model. Um, it's going to do an opening detection and then it's going to lay out the panels and then it's going to do some cuts and other things in order to detail the panels as it's needed. Um, so that uh, it then produces this layout, which is a, an optimized layout for the constraints of that panel to produce the enclosure needed. And it's going to find some warnings if it has some lengths that are shorter than a recommended distance. And uh, it will also output, for instance, the bomb of all of the panels that need to be ordered uh, from this particular manufacturer in order to install um, these panels on site. Um, the other thing the, that we do is in the template, we have the ability to then generate all the shop drawings so that in the plant where they need to uh, assemble all of these, we can um, produce the drawings that are needed by the, the plant in order to do the assembly of the panel. So I'm just going to, let's see, where is that? Uh, this shows it to you in context of, this is for an elevator, or sorry, a staircase. And um, once it's in a, the, the, that high high level assemblies integrated into the the environment it came from and then here are the um, the assembly drawings for you know the pieces and parts that need to be assembled in order to produce that um, stair core enclosure using that standardized panel um, and as, as we said because this is a panelized system that is then produced in a in a plant we have a panel drawing for every panel and nobody drew these by hand these were all automatically generated by the by the configurable system uh, in our platform uh, so, that is basically the summary of what it means to do generative configure to order and do productization of buildings. So, just as a summary, how we go from bespoke engineering to order to this generative configure to order is we first have a team doing off cycle products that could be within our company or it could be a supplier like the wall panel producer or Schindler. And we then kick off a project just like normally do with a project team we make concept geometry we go to bim lod 200 but then we use those off cycle products and modules in order to co-create the finished design and specify exactly how we're going to do it with those finished modules and then we use that to inform the field execution and reduce the number of things that need to be installed on site to make the whole process more efficient I'm going to show you one more example, and this is in data centers. We had another partner. Uh, so we are doing data center work with, you know, most of the big names you would recognize in the IT space. Uh, those are all confidential, and I can't show them to you. But our, our partner, CADMakers, has put this video out on YouTube, and you can see the the, the link to this if you want to look at it yourself, of, uh, of doing um, this sort of generative approach to data centers. So just like I said, the concept model uh, can be done uh, using our tools, um, in this case, um, Generative Innovator uh, can be used for doing this type of conceptual layout of you know, transparent boxes, which are in this case compute units and, and racks for servers. Um, and then this will uh, have several optimizations that in this case the partner has built to optimize the layout for various considerations. Um, and like I said, the, 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 where you do the general arrangement is really up to you. It can be done in Revit and you can mess around with Dynamo. It could be done in the, the hospital uh, conceptual tool that we built. It could be done using generative, administra uh, generative innovator on our platform. It could be done using EKL scripting. All, there's all sorts of ways to, to, to do the conceptual design and optimize the layout. Once you, you've gotten there though, um, you're going to, once you get past that, you're gonna simulate to so make sure your optimization is reaching the kind of, um, for instance, uh, power usage you want and your cooling is effective and um, you can do that right on the platform because it's data driven and we have the tools built in for you to even just at this level um, come up with the necessary cooling and power strategies for for this amount of uh, server racks in this particular data center and then once you've been satisfied that you've got everything the way you want it you then invoke the generative process um, to create the actual physical data center. Um, in which case, I'm probably going to jump ahead again. Let's see, because we're probably doing more optimizations here. 
and now we're going to generate the actual components um, that are that are uh, generated using the the layout that we did in concept to produce actually all the parts. So you're seeing the cable racks and the the, the server enclosures and the the panel boards and the electrical conduit and all that stuff, uh, the duct work being generated um, based on the scripting rules that were created to to make this engineering master. Um, so same thing applied to data centers, um, in this case done by a partner, a uh, very skilled partner. Um, just like desktop engineering is a very skilled partner and could 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 do something like this. Um, so, you know, we have partners in various parts of the world that are able to use our tools in advanced ways to solve these problems. And, you know, I encourage you to, to, to contact desktop engineering if you're interested in a solution like this. Um, so again, here's the, the overall process. Moving from bespoke engineering to order to generative configure to order in order to productize a building. And there are specific benefits at each stage. And these benefits are how we solve the challenges in construction that I listed at the very beginning. So in this case, because we have these off-cycle products, they're more predictable because we're producing them in an industrialized manner. They're indoors. They've already been completely optimized for assembly. They're made using 150% bomb. So we know that any variant that we're going to do has already been pre-engineered. Um, we've already taken all the geographies that are going to be used in into account. So for instance, if we've got different lateral structural systems that need to be in any one of the 100% configured output, that all of those are already in the 150% bomb. And so <clears throat> this optimizes production because we can easily generate the list of parts that we need in order to produce one of these um, configured outputs. And also increases quality because if we know that we're going into a place where for a certain, say, lateral system isn't allowed, uh, like a shear wall system or a brace frame or, or some other cooling system or other thing, we can account for that in the engineering master. So we know that every time we produce one for a particular geography, we're never going to run into the problem that somebody made a mistake and specified the wrong system. So it, it by definition, will increase the quality of the overall construction because we're doing it in a controlled conditions and we have certain checks in the process in order to not produce the wrong module. Next, we have the, the concept geometry, and this is how we fit the project to the site. We know that the site is going to be different. We know these modules are going to be used in different ways, and so this is how we um, rationalize the ability to use these modules on the site in order to achieve what we want in this particular project. So this is how we can fit this to a diverse range of sites. Uh, and fit it to all kinds of project scales in any geography. It's by using the, the standard project kickoff approach you use today, using whatever BIM tools you use now, if you choose to do it that way. The difference is uh, when we get to the next phase, when we get into co-creations, we fit the modules to the project because we've done the conceptual layout and we take that as an input to the generation process to get the 100% configured output. This generally drastically reduces the timeline because now we have a good chunk of the building that's already been pre-engineered. We know it's already optimized and we can focus on just the parts that are custom to this project and make sure that they're done right and coordinated with the modules that are going to be coming from some prefab plant or assembly plant somewhere. These things are, are by definition, multi-trade. So you know that the, the, the trades within the module are already coordinated, and you can focus on making sure that the services going to the interface points are optimal and aren't clashing anywhere. And again, you can do this in any geography. So um, this co-creation process isn't limited, really, to any site or any geography. It's it's the standard way that we, we do this. And then, of course, because we're relying on these modules and we have fewer things to get to the site, it's going to be more predictable. Because as long as we manage the fewer number of things, which are going to be easier to manage, uh, we're going to get more predictability. We know where the interface points are, so that should be no surprise. And that's generally going to reduce the timeline uh, uh, pretty drastically on, on the field installation. Uh, as a result, we also have less skilled labor because um, you know these these modules have been uh, largely made off-site, and uh, we have very specific things that have to be done by skilled labor on-site, and we know uh, very well in advance when those things are going to be. Again, it can apply to any geography, and again, it can apply to any topology of partners or or contracts that those partners execute with each other. And so, as you can see, we, we get a different set of benefits at different 
parts of this process, but the net result is a, a, an overall system improvement in the, the construction outcome. Um, and that is that we go from unpredictability to predictability. And it relies on the fact that we have these modules and we've optimized them and we know the interface points. And so we can focus on all the parts outside of that large piece of scope and make sure that those are done right. This then greatly reduces the timeline to deliver the overall facility because a lot of that work is done ahead of time by the off-cycle product team. Again, um, we, we've illustrated how this can be applied to small projects and huge projects. It can really scale to all size of projects. And we've illustrated can fit a diversity of sites because we fit the project to the site at the concept stage, very similar to, to how it's done today, if there's any change at all. Um, there's much less need for skilled labor because we're doing these multi-trade assemblies in an off-site plant. We've hired people specifically to do that assembly. And then we know where those interface points are when we get to the field. And we know when we're going to have to have that skilled labor in, in order to um, serve those interface points uh, for uh, electrical or, or, or a water system or, or an air movement system. Again, it applies to any geography. We sort of showed that and can be used by any combination of construction partners and contracting types really doesn't affect this. Um, and in fact, um, it, in the case of the, the companies I've talked about, they, they in certain cases are producing their own modules. In some cases, they're contracting with other companies for other companies to produce modules. Uh, but in general, the approach is the same, whether you're producing the modules or you're partnering with somebody else to produce the modules. And this uh, is really the way, in fact, that we produce all sorts of industrial goods, whether they be cars or airplanes or other things, um, using this type of approach by partnering with uh, other companies to make modules with known interface points. So I hope that was really educational. We're going to have a, a Q&A uh, portion uh, afterwards. And I, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. And um, uh, I think uh, we'll be ready to take questions after this.